this tutorial video we are going to talk about how to design your very first car in automation and get it exported to BeamNG. And before we jump right into that, how about we set up your actual measurements, the units you want to use, because that might be a, a little bit of an issue for many people. So there we have that set up, let's jump into the sandbox. And you won't find any sandcastles here. I have a few cars sitting in here, but uh, you will probably at that point have zero and you need to create your very first one. You do that with the new model button. Then you are presented with a big list of cars and that list is actually quite a bit larger than what you see. Uh, if you go into the variant view, you get to see every variant available for every car and that list is pretty long. Long, but not complete. There will of course be more cars added in future. Let's say we want to design a car in the year 1982. Sounds good to me. Uh, yeah, how about this little one? You are first selecting the body itself with all its variants and you're going to choose the body variant you want to use a little later. First thing first, the chassis choices. What kind of materials you want, the engine placement and the type of suspension. Once you're done, we are going forward into the engine designer. And I'm not going to explain the engine designer to you because there are some excellent tutorials for you to uh, play and that you can do from the challenges menu in the main menu. There are a few scenarios or quite, quite a few scenarios actually that will help you out understand what the engine designer is all about. So let me just put together a little engine here. But one thing to be aware of instantly is that, um, let's select that, yeah, it can get too big and you will be warned about that via the size arrows. If you don't see any, it's probably good. This very first tab is the design of the engine family. Engines are separated into their family and the variants. This is the family button, this is the variance button. Just like cars are being separated into the model and the trim. Now I'm just running through and selecting a few components for my engine, just like the various tutorials teach you. Once you have chosen the second muffler, uh, you are basically done designing your engine or the first iteration of your engine and most likely a lot of warnings will pop up but that is normal just go and fix them i'm lucky in this case because i've made a super powerful engine with 57 horsepower perfect for a little car like this and once you're done uh, with the tuning uh, yeah, 60 horsepower even better once you're done with that we head forwards and that is where you choose your body variant. So, uh, which one do we want to go for? A lot of fun ones in here, but I think the most fun would be this one. Oh yeah, not too shabby. Okay, let's roll with this. Paints. Uh, how about uh, 80s baby blue? Yeah, and this is where you are going to shape your car as well. And... Uh, yeah, as soon as you're happy, you can abort this at any point. Ah, what a sporty little car. Yes, the shape is right. Now, you come to the fixtures tab. And I would recommend that you do not do your visual design first, but rather continue the technical design, check if you're actually satisfied with what you're building there, and if it's maybe inspiring something a little different along the way and first when you are absolutely satisfied with your uh, technical design you come back here and spend x number of minutes on the visuals first up in the car is setting up your drivetrain and your gearbox and differentials and so on then we continue on to the tire choices also important to note is that whenever you are not quite clear what the components you're choosing are, there is a help for that. And that is the descriptions that are hidden behind the headings. Whenever you want to know anything here, just click on it and most likely it has a uh, pretty good description in here. This is the upper one is always for the main section 
and the lower one is for the component you currently have selected. Alright, happy with the tire choices? Just move on. Brakes are next. Important to note is that whatever you set here in the first run through isn't really all too relevant because most of the aspects you are going to fine tune anyway. It's just trying to get something in the ballpark at first and then come back to it later. Yes, it is quite difficult to get it in the ballpark the first time around if you are not familiar with the game uh, or cars in general even, but um, you will learn pretty quickly because of the warning system that is in place that kicks into, uh, into full gears once you go to the actual testing page and have designed your car. So that is the first goal. Just get through once, get to the testing page and then see what fine tuning needs to be done. Nothing here for us on the aerody aerodynamics tab unless you have actually put wings on it. Um, the under tray of course always is an option but for this little car, nah, not really. Ah. Okay, seating configuration, interior tab, that is next. I, I don't really think that will be comfortable with five people in it. Let's go with four and then we are maybe lucky and can fit a phonograph in the middle of them or something. Or maybe just an eight-track player. Ah, oh, those eight-tracks, brilliant. Power steering, essential for heavier cars, not so much for this little one. Safety package, well, who needs safety? You're going to test it in BeamNG. What could possibly go wrong? And once you have chosen uh, various springs, dampers and sway bars, all of a sudden, all kinds of graphs are popping up and loads of stats. And this is marking the completion of this car design. Well, it's not tuned or anything yet, but uh, this is your starting point for the tuning. The suspension is set to its default values and because this is a very light car, this is actually a little stiff, just a little bit. I mean, a hypercar usually has a roll angle of about 3 degrees. This one has 2.6. That sounds about right for stiffness, maybe? M m maybe not. The uh, default settings, or the presets rather, are working pretty well. If you're unsure what to use, just click one of these which seems right and it will most likely be pretty close to what you want or need. And then we are on the testing page and on the testing page you get a little summary of your car but also you can visit the markets and see what they think about your car and if you don't know why the muscle car category doesn't like the car you can just hover over it and get all kinds of information. On to the right there you see what this demographic likes and how, how the scoring is weighted and uh, yeah th this doesn't look like a proper muscle car to me prestige but this, this looks prestigious maybe if we installed the phonograph that would be a little bit better in the detailed stats if you're wondering why your stats suck this is the page that will tell you more there's a list of the major and minor stats on the side which most of the demographics are all about and if you're wondering why, hmm, comfort, why is our comfort rating so low? The only thing you need to do is click on the comfort button and you will see what sections are biting you in the butt for a higher scoring. Currently we have a base score of 23.8 and a modifier, a summed modifier of minus 29.6%, mainly due to the interior and the lack of passenger volume. And because these graphs are not properly explained right now in the game, let me just run through them quickly so that you get a little bit of an overview. The first one is the gearing graph, which shows you with a red line what your current top speed is, or where it's sitting. And then you have the gears listed here, the yellow curves, and they respond to your inputs in gearing. And uh, in, in this, this setup, for instance, we have an overdrive gear. We've just set it up. You can't choose that. You have to make it yourself. If you want to optimize acceleration from 0 to 100 or 0 to 62 miles per hour, then a, I would recommend that you make a gear, for instance, second gear, go to exactly that plus one kilometer now or mile per hour. That usually works pretty well. The other graph on here is very important too. It's the power versus traction graph 
Well, well, this is a rear-wheel drive vehicle because we chose it as such. It's a longitudinal mounted engine and a rear-wheel drive configuration. So, all the power goes to the rear. That's why these curves here are blue. And this curve, which I'm currently marking with the mouse, is the grip you have available. And as you can see, the yellow line never really touches that grip level apart from almost there. That means we have overall pretty low wheel spin numbers, which is good because there is no driver aids whatsoever in the traction department. Don't get too worried about the wheel spin numbers that are shown here in the spacing and top speed as uh, gear detailed stats, but rather this number is what is uh, causing you to lose drivability. And of course you want to keep it low, but not necessarily zero. That might be a very bad compromise, depending on what you do. One of the most important graphs is the steering behavior graph. It basically shows you if your car is understeering or oversteering and how it behaves at the very extreme. This car, the yellow curve, that is the steering behavior, this car is moderately understeering, such that it's actually, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty well set up. The red line marks kind of neutral steering behavior, and neutral, off power, usually means that it's pretty sporty. If you want to make something really sporty, you want to move the sportiness indicator as close to the, or on top of the red line as you can get. While if you want to make something as drivable as possible, you want to move the drivability marker down to the blue line. The easiest and most drastic way of doing so is via tires and tire width more accurately. Oh, look at that. Now we have a somewhat oversteery car, but at the extreme, it is still understeering, which is good. You never want to make cars that are terminally oversteering because they are considered death machines. But also, no one wants to drive something like this. And this just doesn't sell because it's, well, it's undrivable. In the brake graph, you see the comparison between grip for rear and grip in front to the force that is put on the brakes in the rear and the front, respectively. So in this one, we see that the um, brighter line is the grip and you see that the uh, dark line is actually higher than the lighter line. That means that we are putting more force uh, onto the tires than what grip levels would allow for. That means that rear brakes are locking up when we are braking hard. The opposite is true for this configuration in the front that we currently have. And of course that is not necessarily great for drivability. So let me even that out. You have various options to do so. That would be through size, through caliper choice. Just try it out and uh, you will see what happens. But in this case, I think the easiest would be to just, to just adjust the brake bias and that should be, should be moving us closer to where we need to be. Something like this maybe. It's definitely good enough for the error. 43 meters break distance from uh, zero from 100 to zero kilometers an hour. Not bad for a car like that. Oh, then the aerodynamics. Well, downforce is a little bit more advanced, but let me show you. The steering graph exists in two ways, the slow corner and the fast corner. And yes, you can switch graphs up here wherever you want. And this one uh, showed you the steering behavior at the low corner speed and we've already tuned it for that. But also for sports cars might be important how well they steer at higher speeds. And uh, the same rules apply here, but there are no distinct markers that you want to push this grip level as high as possible. And the, the higher grip you get, the higher the speed you can carry through those corners. Important for sports cars, but not really for much else. The last graph I need to explain here would be the bump graph. It's basically letting the car drive off a ledge which is one centimeter high and see how the suspension reacts. What you want to achieve here is that the two slightly offset curves start to align as quickly as possible and stay together if you can make that happen. That gives you the best kind of behavior while not being too stiff or too soft. 
What is too stiff or too soft? Well, this one, this little question mark here at the side, will give you quite some good information about what is considered stiff, what is considered too soft, and when you start to feel like a boat and have to vomit. So, once you're super happy with all that designing and setting up of the technical stuff, I'd recommend getting back to the design and really, really hammer that out, like I do. Like, like this. The pinnacle of design, right here. The only real suggestions I have for you is that layering, kind of important, layer different fixtures on top of each other, try to combine them in creative ways and use the various uh, options down here to your advantage, mirroring, uh, resizing, aligning them to different uh, different slopes of the car and of course um, rotating and my favorite feature the undo yes because I, I do bad things often one thing I would like to highlight though is the material system when we place down a fixture then you will have the option of different materials for each component within the fixture and you can change those around with the predefined colors you're using and other materials, like fancy carbon fiber outsides for our uh, e eco shitbox. Or something like this. So now let's say you are super happy with your car, it is your dream car, and you will definitely buy it if you had the A, the money, and B, you could. And now you want to drive it. Drive it in BeamNG. How do you do that? Well, simply. You go to the summary page and export the car to BeamNG. Alternatively, you can just quit out, it's already saved, and then find the car in the list. And we have it sitting right there. You have it selected and you can export it here. And there we have it. There's our little car. So this is the exporter menu. You just choose a name for your, for your new mod and very, very creatively chosen. Model 1, Trim 1. Perfect. And then the only thing left to do is to hit the export button. But Kirob, what did the export button do? Well, it placed your car right in the car list in BeamNG Drive. So yeah, why why not why are you still here? You wanted to drive it. So that's it. I hope this is a little helpful and gets you started. And I wish you a happy designing, happy testing, and happy crashing.